Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. George Monroe, welcome to the Center of the Universe. Thanks for coming out, man. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. You do live in Hanover County. Man. I do. I do. Wait, what's the name of the little place you live? Beaver Dam. Can you go any farther west in Hanover County <laughs> past Beaver Dam? You have to run into another county, I think, first. Right? Uh, Louisa County, Spotsylvania, Caroline, choose one. You're right there at the northwest right corner. Right there in the northwest corner. I mean, you can't get any farther away. Mm-mm. I mean, it's the middle of nowhere, right? I mean, you know, I, when you back up to the uh, North Anna River like I do, I guess you can't really. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> can't I'm go far as, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, I can walk in my backyard another I don't know. From from my house to the to the river is probably a mile. Okay, you know, down in the woods, and it, I'm, I'm and right you there. like it like that. Love it. Yeah, Love that's it. cool. Yeah. All right, where'd you grow up? Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, in an area of Charlottesville known as Fifeville. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I went to school in Charlottesville. Tell, tell me where that is. All right. So if all right, so we always uh, we knew that the uh, the UVA students were told never to cross the railroad tracks where I lived. <laughs> right. So. If you if you know where the railroad tracks are, then um, we're right off of Nine and a Half Street, Cherry Avenue. Okay. Uh, so that whole area right there, going back towards um, what they refer to as Fifth Street Extended now, is known as Fifeville. Okay. So uh, Orange Hill Avenue Prospect, out that way. I lived on Thirteenth. Thirteenth. So you were up towards Grady. There was a Lucky Seven. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. 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 yeah I didn't go to that Lucky Seven very much. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. All right. So you spent your, the first eighteen years of your life in Charlottesville. Yeah. yeah I, well, um, I, I, you know, back before we started this conversation, you know, I, I was raised in Alamo County by my great grandmother. Oh, okay. Um, you know, until I was probably about twelve or thirteen years old, and then um, my father, you know, we married, and um, you know, we uh, moved into Charlottesville proper, and um, yeah, yeah. So from probably about the time I was thirteen. So when your great grandmother raised you. Did you consider that Charlottesville Metro, or is that not a thing? No, I, I consider that an Albemarle County yeah. in a place called Blenheim, um, affectionately known as Monroe Town. Okay, um, because you know there's a deep history associated um, with the family, and but you know that that area um, is situated between uh, Scottsville mm-hmm. and basically Zion Crossroads, Fulvana County. Yeah. Okay. So you're so, you're so kind right of out in the country. country. Yeah, in the country. Yeah. Yeah. On a farm, actually. Yeah. Uh, working farm. Yeah. You grew up on a farm. Yeah. yeah. Which leads you to a farm now, right? Yeah. Or are you on a farm now? I, I mean, I, it's 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 a ten acre lot out there in Beaverdam, but you know, you, you're I, not farming, but you could if you wanted. You're to. farming. I'm farming. <laughs> are you really? Yeah, uh, yeah. I got gardens, and I got um, you know, I'm I'm an avid outdoorsman, so I raise hounds. Oh wow! You know, so I have uh, beagles and walker hounds that I raise and. I'm also a president of a hunt club in Louisa County. So, so I'm, I'm from Hanover County. Yeah. You're from uh, uh, Albemarle, which yeah. is very similar counties. Right. You're, you're more country than I am. <laughs> I think that's right. I don't hunt. But I you don't know, raise I, dogs. I call myself a, uh, a country boy in training. You okay. know what I'm saying? Because hmm. when I was coming up, you know, living on a farm felt like more like a chore. Hmm. And now for me, being older, almost 50, I look at it as, you know, I can appreciate the way of life because of the the self-sufficiency involved and the ability to be able to grow your own food and, and of course being a being a sportsman being able to hunt my food and you know process it you know so really being self-sustaining right so i appreciate that that lesson now at this point that i learned from the farm growing up now what and we don't want to probably go too deep right now we're, we're talking about you <laughs> growing well, up well by, by the way kevin flippin's joining us tonight as co <laughs> sorry yeah, I, I, yeah. I meant to mention you earlier kevin. yeah sorry. yeah yeah um uh well now you're gonna throw me off you said cows are there yeah. pigs are there other animals or is it just cows oh no so on the farm back home um my my i call him uncle grandpa mm. because you know he was more like a grandfather for me um than anything um he raised uh cows well we raised cows um pigs chickens um what else there was a goat i believe mm. and um yeah, that was pretty much it. And then, of course, there was uh, on the farm, there was at least three gardens. You know, you had one garden for sweet potatoes. You had garden, you had gardens for like your, your, your spring, summer crops. Yeah. And then, of course, you had that, that late kind of summer, early fall garden for your greens and stuff by Thanksgiving. And it was it was what I refer to as substance farming, where like, you know, you have your chicken coops and stuff like that. 
in one section or your cows in one section and then of course they would be rotated to another section mm. and then you would farm that particular section because of the nitrogen that was put in the ground you know what I'm saying from wow. that particular you piece. can't reuse the same soil over and over again right. yeah. but you know that with the animals being on top of the soil like the cows and, and the chickens and whatnot, they're actually basically um, what, do you, what do you call it they're basically kind of um, conditioning the soil for for vegetables because of the right. nitrogen oh, yeah. and the calcium for, because of the pro- byproduct, right? And, you know, so it's kind of funny. Like you go to school and you you know take all these classes agriculturally, but you know these guys was doing that type of thing that we study from a theory standpoint. You know, for, yeah, since yeah. forever. So if, since yeah. there was only one goat, I'm assuming its name was Jordan. <laughs> come, come on, man! It's way too <laughs> early in this episode for you to be talking about that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, did you did you know how to garden, or were you just there to like plant and pick? Oh no, we we was taught. Good for you. Um, you know, from the time I was probably eight, nine, ten years old. You know, um, hell, I was driving a car on the farm. Ten, eleven years old. <laughs> I love you it. You know, tractors. Oh, that's cool. Because because um, you needed to, right? Yeah. Because yeah. my great uncle, you know, he he was um he was an awesome man. I mean, he was uh, he was paralyzed on one side. And he did the work of two men mm. with one with the use of one arm and one leg. Wow. And, you know, very self-sufficient. And where he needed help, I, I helped him. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, you know, think about what it takes to kind of, you know, just do cows, for example. This was back when you had to mend your fences, the barbed wires. And you had the different tools and the staples. These, you know, these weren't staple guns. Right. These were hammers and actual staples, you know, that you had to mend fences with. And then, of course, when the winter came... Pulling the hay out and tossing the hay. You know what I'm saying? What and a role model for work ethic. Oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah. amazing. And, you know, we talked briefly about my time in the Marine Corps. When I hit Paris Island and um, after you got out of the kind of like the, um, you know, the receiving, hey, <laughs> you know, this was nothing. You know what I'm saying? Compared to life on the farm because, right. you know, 4.30 in the morning you were up, you know, and this house was built by my great-great-grandfather. And so there was no running plumbing mm. except for a pipe coming in from the well. Wow. So there was an outhouse, and my job was to basically go around and pick up the buckets at night. I mean, from the previous night, you know. Because you were the young man. Because I was the youngest. You yeah. know, well, my brother was the youngest, but, you know, he he was probably six or seven at the time. I was probably eight, nine, ten. So I could handle it, you know what I'm saying, as far as doing those chores. The other job was to basically go out, get the kindling, and start the fire to get the house warm. So, so everybody would get up with my grandmother and everything to cook. So, you know, this was this was hardcore country living. Yeah. You know, an old school living. And it wasn't until probably the the mid probably the mid eighties that they actually got um you know, an actual like bathroom installed with a tub. So let, so let's back up. Yeah. You have water coming to the house from a well. From a well. How did you do personal hygiene? There, there was an old tin, tin tub, and what what we would do is we would boil water on the on the own wood stove, the country stove, right, mm-hmm. cook stove, and take that take that hot water and pour it into the tin tub. Mm. And you're basically standing in that tin tub and you're scrubbing yourself and you're rinsing yourself off. And then when you're done, you drag the tub outside and you dump your water. And so you were doing personal hygiene like that until you moved into the into Charlottesville. Yeah. 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 Wow. You know, and I, you know, it, it, it sounds it sounds crazy, but you know, I wouldn't have changed that experience for the world. Well, it made you who you are. It made me who I am. It also made you tougher than the average bear, too. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, because um, I remember one time I was uh, ten years old and I um, was complaining to my grandmother about my hands being cold, <laughs> and she just looked at me <laughs> and she said, uh, "What did I ask you to do?" And I said, "You told me to go outside. You told me to get to kindling for the fire." And it brings some firewood in the house. And she's like, so why are you still standing here? Mm. So in other words, I don't care nothing about how cold your hands <laughs> right. are. Go you, get the work done. You got work that needs to be done. Yeah. Right. And so it's kind of funny because I have this same lesson with my kids now. And I always tell them, I'm like, if you don't hear me complaining, then you guys don't complain at all. Because I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not moved. And I tell my kids. I'm not moved by tears. I'm not moved by your complaining. I'm moved by you actually getting the job done and meeting your objectives. Yeah, being productive. Yeah. 
So, you know, some people might consider that harsh, but I think at the end of the day, the world doesn't care how sensitive kids are. Mm -mm. They They don't. don't. No. When they they leave your house, the world does not care. So, you know, I raised my kids to be, you know, um, no nonsense because that's the trait of my family. Um, because of the living, you know, like how we were brought up, like, and, and I tell my younger cousins all the time, you guys never spent time down in Blenheim. <laughs> yeah, you weren't, you weren't, you, you, you didn't have to, um, you, you weren't cut from that cloth, you know, because you can tell it, you know what I'm saying? Sure. As far as, as far as my kid, my, my cousins that have, you know, that have grown up in Charlottesville or surrounding areas, like when you come off of that farm, you are equipped to handle anything in life, and that's just the way they. They kind of birthed us. Yeah. You know, call it a generation of transition, I think. Well, it's hard to maintain that through the generations, right? Because yeah. generations do get softer with technology and, right. and conveniences and that sort of thing. Right. But we do our best to make sure that our kids are independent by the time they leave the house. And it's tough, right? Because um, I live relatively comfortable. You know, I live in Anderson Mill. You know, we have nice size houses out there, property. We got the internet, you know, running water, of course. And, the kids pretty much, you know, I've done well in life, you know, and the kids pretty much don't necessarily have to you know, really want for anything. But it's like those lessons coming off of that farm, it's like, while well, hard at the time, you know, you kind of wish that you can instill some of those kind of values or at least for that matter, try to teach them a, a, a certain way of, you know, kind of getting those lessons without shocking them completely. Right. You know, like, of course, I'm not going to have my kids bathing in a in a. In a in a tent tub, you know what I'm saying. When they got a house with a bathroom or two in there where they can do that, right? But how does that? But how do you actually teach these kids to, um, be I guess be strong stronger mentally, physically, you know, and and with all these modern conveniences, right? And it's like um, I liken it, liken myself to kind of being that old grungy football coach, where it's like I'm pushing you to be the best you can, but it's kind of like it's a balance that you actually have to make sure that you maintain because you don't want to break anybody with any sort of anything crazy. Right, right. So you want them to experience adversity and, and have them figure it out on their own. Now exactly. you, you're there to help and to avoid it getting crazy. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but they, sure. they need to go through some adversity. Otherwise, the world's going to beat them up right, in right. a bad way. And I wouldn't want that adversity that I went through because you know, they, like like we talked about previously, you know, there was a reason why I was on the farm. You know, as far as the breakdown of my nuclear family with my mom and dad splitting up. You know, so going to the farm, I mean, that's that's the only place we really could end up, so to speak, because we were with family and, you know, my, my father, of course, grew up the same way. So he trusted that situation for his kids while he was off working. Right. Right. So, you know, um, but those life lessons, I mean, while hard, you know, they, they conditioned me to be who I am. And, you know, I, I, I just know that anything that life throws at me, I, I can face it in a certain way. Oh, yeah. Where it's like, you know, I, I can get through anything. Right. You know, and that's that's the lesson that I want my kids to see. No matter what, you know, comes at you, you have this fortitude, the internal fortitude to be able to push through no matter the odds or the circumstances you're faced with. Yeah. No, that's brilliant for your kids to learn from that. Uh, are they going to listen to this, by the way? Yeah, I'm pretty certain they will be. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> voluntarily, or are you going to say, hey, you need to check this out? <laughs> oh, voluntarily. These guys, I'm, I'm going to make sure. They'll be voluntold. <laughs> voluntold is a better word. Right, before we talk about you moving to Charlottesville, yeah. Um, when I was younger, we had a garden. We didn't have a farm or anything, but we did have a, we raised a garden. And my parents, I don't recall them teaching me anything. So I think it's really cool that you were taught, or, or maybe you were self-taught. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention. I was just doing whatever thing they told me to do just to get, get it done. Yeah. But they were, they were orally teaching you, it sounds like. Or were you, you learning on your own? So, so here, here's, here's, here's an example of what being taught at, on the farm was like. Um, boy, go get that. Go get it fast, and if you don't move fast enough, there's a whack across your head, mm. right? And you paying attention? Are you listening? And then watch what I'm doing. And then after you watch, now you finish the rest of it. So they wanted you. They intentionally wanted you to learn, and they they gave you an attention getter. You're gonna get a whack in the head if you don't pay attention. Oh to yeah, what I tell oh, you. Yeah. And and then, then the model was if you don't do it right the first time, you gotta do it again. Yeah. And then there's consequences with that. Right. You know, now, of course, I'm a lot softer with my kids, you know, and a lot of times what I find myself doing is, damn, I was like, if I have to slow down long enough to tell you this stuff, then 
I could already had it done by now. Right. So then there's a challenge for me because of the way I was raised to kind of slow it down some. It's hard to slow down. And actually instruct because it's like, I'm like, if I got to tell you two or three times, then I should have just gone ahead and did it myself. Right. Right. But it's, it's funny because, like, you know how the, the adage goes, right? You love each of your kids differently. Like, I have my my um, my um two older kids were go-getters because I was younger, of course, when I had them. And when I was raising them up here in Hanover County. Right. And um, so they knew exactly what I was doing when I was doing it, and they was on it. Like, after the first couple of times, I didn't have to ask them to do anything. They, like, it was just done. Yeah. It's kind of like how I grew up. But these other two. Right. I'm, you know, I'm younger. I mean, I'm older. You know what I'm saying? They're coming along in age, right? So my, my son, Trey, who, who plays football with Patrick Henry on the JV team, um, he's turning 15 in December. My other son, who's starting at Liberty, he just turned 12. He's going out for Liberty football. It's like, I I think it's age where I'm more patient with them and I'm actually showing them stuff. And I'm like, this is the reason why you do this. And this is the reason why you do that. And make sure you do it this way. And then I'm, I'm more of supervisory versus like, get it done. Right. Right, and I don't know if that's a, because of age or maturity age or whatever. You, yeah, you, you slow down a little bit, probably. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but these kids, um, you know, the the, the youngest, the, the baby boy, he is a lot like how I was. You know, this this guy, I'll be working on something. He say, "Hey, Dad, what you doing?" I'm like, "I'm doing this, son. I'm making this, doing it." You know, I, like for example, I was painting the man cave. He said, "Why do you do it that way?" I said, "Because if I do it this way, you know, it, it'll give me a certain result." And he's like, "Oh, okay." So you, what you're saying is if, like, I think in this particular case, I had a, a brush and I was cutting it a certain way so that way I didn't have to put any tape up, right? right. He's like, so if you do it that way, you don't have to worry about spending money on tape and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah. He said, okay. And this kid got it, right? He gets it. He's and inquisitive he's, and, he's, and he's listening. And then he'll, he'll pick it up and he'll, he knocks it out. And I'm like, that's impressive. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like... um. So I would say that all of my kids is funny because I when I look at them, they all have bits and pieces of my personality. And the youngest one is, is, is kind of funny because not only does he have bits and pieces of my, my personality, he's actually shaped like me. Hmm. So when he, so when we're actually together, he's like a mini version of me. And it's funny because he's standing like I am. And, you know, he's got the same facial expressions. And it's a trip to watch, you know. And so he's, he's, he's the one that's... Um, you know, if, if anybody, when you think about like, you know, you know, the, the kid that's probably going to be more like you and your mannerisms and your personality, he's probably it. Yeah, that's you cool. Know? And then, of course, my my uh, my 14 year old, he's um, he's very inquisitive. He's very intense. You know, he took martial arts up here at uh, Rise mm-hmm. in Ashland. He got a second degree black belt. Nice. You know, before he was age 12. Yeah, that's cool. And so he's really, really intense, really focused. You know what I'm saying? Really, really, um, really purposeful in everything he does, and everything he does is planned. He's very strategic, and that's another that's another facet of my personality that I that I watch in my kids. Yeah, that's cool. You know, so yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. Let's back up to Charlottesville. What, yeah. what what took you to Charlottesville? Father got remarried. Okay, he married someone, and it was time for us to become a family. You know, and uh, this is you and your brother, my my brother, and then of course um, my stepmother had a daughter. But, you know, we don't, in my family, we don't do the stepbrother and stepsister thing, you know, with sister and brother. You know, that's, yeah. uh, that's how we were raised. And so um, so it was it was three of us. And then um, we ended up moving uh, into Charlottesville, a place called Westfield. Um, so Westfield is out there. It's a section of Charlottesville, kind of in the Albemarle County, off a hydraulic area, mm-hmm. going out there way past 29, out there towards where I think they have a Walmart out there now. Okay. Um, so all of that area is considered, called, it's called Westfield. And so we were out there and, um, you know, that's when I started really forming a lot of the relationships that I maintain today, you know, with, uh, you know, some, some of my childhood friends. Cool. Where'd you go to high yeah. school? Charlottesville High School. Okay. Yeah. Were they known for athletics? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, back at least back in the um, the eighties and nineties we were. You know, we pretty much cleaned up everything um, within that kind of area. Uh, I guess you would call it a metro area now. Um, and uh, anything from Louisa all the way up to Harrisonburg, in that particular district, you know, we pretty much, you know, football, basketball, track and field. I mean, we were we were it. Yeah. Who you came know? out of there that we might know? Uh, Eric Wilson. Okay. Um, Aaron Stinney. Mm. He won a Super Bowl with the uh, with the Bucks. Yep. Um, yeah, we had his dad on the podcast. Yeah, Phil Stinney. Yep. 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 Phil Stinney's another one, right? Um, 
Rashad uh, Rashad Davis. Mm-hmm. He he went to he went to Charlotte High School, and uh, got a Super Bowl with the Philadelphia Eagles. And um, who else? Um, the George Monroe guy. Yeah, but I don't. You know, I mean, I was I was a decent athlete. You know what I'm saying? But decent. We we need to get into that. <laughs> Go ahead and get into it. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about track, man. I want to hear yeah, about it. Yeah, so, you know, track track was cool. You know, I, um, ninth grade, you know, I first first let me back up. You know, eighth grade, you know, they had this thing called Hershey's. Um, it's like an amateur, like like a youth track and field kind of organization yeah. affiliated with Hershey Park. So, like, they do track and field events and everything like that. So, I basically ran in Charlottesville, eighth grade, and, um, you know, I won the district. Won the regional, and we're like, talking about what for a hundred meter, hundred meter, okay. Yeah, and then um, eventually in the eighth grade, I went to um, went to the state and took second, and so they ran they ran states at the uh, University of Virginia, okay, and, and on the track there, and so they took the winner of each state to Hershey to actually compete in nationals. Oh, so Hershey, the, Hershey had nationals. Yeah, I so figured had, I figured it was like East Coast. Yeah, yeah. So they so they so they um so they took the, the the winners of each state to to nationals. So I didn't make nationals, but I did take second in state. And um so the the, the track coach at Charlottesville High, High School happened to be out there, and um so he asked me what school I was going to. So at the time I was going to Jack Jewett Middle, which would flow up to the other high school in the area known as Albemarle. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> This but, is this is where coaches have fun with kids. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so then what happened was um, that summer, my dad actually moved in across the line into the actual Charlottesville proper. So we actually lived in Charlottesville um, in that area that I was telling you about. And um, so ninth grade comes, you know, we have football. Football was great. You know what I'm saying? There's another guy by the name of Larry Mitchell hmm. uh, who was a wide receiver. Um at the time and uh he ended up playing for the Phillies. Okay. Uh in baseball. And um so I, w- I was a star I was a backup to him in the ninth grade. And uh so Charlottesville to kind of give you an idea about the sports teams then. We were blowing out teams forty to nothing by halftime. You know, and so then you got your ninth graders and your J V guys going in and basically playing too. And so I got my I cut my teeth playing varsity in eighth grade and actually ended up getting a letter. Um, in, in eighth grade, ninth grade, ninth grade. Right. Yeah. So, so then after football and everything, you know, we do track. I, I didn't run into a track that year, but then in the spring came, and I got this grand idea that I wanted to play lacrosse hmm. as opposed to running track. What in the world plant put that thought in your head? It got to hit somebody. Oh, and this yeah. is this is the mid With a stick. This is this is eighty eight. Okay, 80, 88, 89. And so, um, yeah. So you know, I go out for track, go out for lacrosse. And um, it's, the funny thing was, I remember like it was yesterday. I was out there with the stick, you know, throwing a ball and everything like that. We were getting our plays and routines and everything down. And I remember the coach, the track coach, the guy named Curtis Elder. They just recently named the uh, the track and field at the um, stadium complex in Charlottesville High School after him. I remember him driving a gray Volvo. He was going up the hill. He saw me running with the stick and he, he said, <laughs> and he put the car in reverse, came back, parked. Walked on the field, had two words with the with the lacrosse coach, came over to me and said, "You're done playing lacrosse. I want to see you on my track Monday." Man, the lacrosse coach couldn't have been happy about this because I would imagine you would have racked up on the lacrosse field. I mean, I, once I mean, once sticks, you learned, once you learned that, stick work, yeah, I was good. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I was I was a natural like with lacrosse, like and you know, and I still kind of have an affinity for the sport, right? It's a fun sport. Yeah, it's a fun sport for sure. But then, but the track coach was like, told you, he said, listen, he told the guy, I said, I saw this kid, I think at the time I was in eighth grade, I ran like an 11 one hundred meter. Which is rolling for a kid that age. Yeah. And uh, he told, he told the lacrosse coach, he's like, this kid could be somebody special. I don't want him on the lacrosse team. He needs to be on the track. Oh, okay. Right. I, I, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I just, you know, did what he told me. So right. here's a funny thing. Get to ninth grade, get on the track. We have our first three outdoor meets. I'm killing the game, right? I've got, I'm, I'm winning the 100 meter. I'm winning the 200 meter. And like the first three or four um, uh, meets, I'm the man, right? But then everybody kept saying, well, you know, the basketball team hasn't come out yet. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because these guys were still resting up from basketball season, you know, after they do their tournaments and everything like that. 
You know, so they were like, wait till these guys come out. Are you still going to be the fastest? Of course, these guys are upperclassmen and this and that. So when these guys joined the team, from ninth grade on, I mean, from that, from that, from that time on, I lost every race. So I went from kind of being the man to like losing every race from that point on. That year or for the rest of high school? That year. That year. Yeah, yeah. And it was like it was it was unsettling because I was like, I was so used to winning, you know. And so I was really discouraged. Like, you know, I was trying to figure out like, okay, well, you know, I don't I don't want to keep running a hundred meter. And these guys are, you know, pretty much state, all state caliber type cats, right? Of course, keeping in mind I'm a south, I mean a freshman at the time. So ninth grade year was really discouraging for me. But then tenth grade came and you know how, like, an indoor track, you know, you have, like, you're running indoors stuff because of the weather outside. I was running with a horse playing with another teammate. And you remember those old school, high uh, high school, uh, in, in the high school, the trash cans? Mm-hmm. Those things kind of be, they were like, like, you know, they'd be really tall. Right. You know? So, you know how you're kind of horse playing, and I'm, I was running backwards, and then somebody yelled, watch out. And I was about to run into uh, one of those big trash cans. So, I turned around just in time. And I hopped it, right? <laughs> and I kid you not, those trash cans had to have been at least four foot tall. Yeah. So. And you just spun before yeah, you hopped it. Yeah. I just hopped it, right? And so then the track coach looked at me. He said, "Come here for a second. <laughs> he was like, "Um, do that again." So I hopped the trash can again. He's like, he "said um, she come with me to the to the track outside." Went outside in the winter time. He had a, set up a hurdle, and um, he said, "Let me see you run over the hurdle." I said, run, you want me to jump? He said, no, I don't want you to jump it. I want you to run it. So I ran and I ran over top of it. Right. And he's like, interesting. And that's all he said. So then we had what they referred to as East Coast Nationals um, down at the uh, University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And um, I think it was called the Big Orange Classic. And so he said, I want you to run a 300 meter hurdles. Now, keep in mind, like, you had teams from Florida, Texas, you know what I'm saying, North Carolina, all of these states. And so I went in there and actually, you know, ran the 300 hurdles for the first time and actually did really well. And so that became the race, right, the 300 hurdles. So then I was like, well, Coach, what about the 110s? He's like, well, are you certain you can run those? I said, well, let me try it. And see, when one of the running the 110s, you know, you're really focused on kind of getting the three steps in between a hurdle. And it's straight, too, the whole and way. It's, it's straight, 110 meters. And um, so I was like, let me try it. So he said, go go to practice and just try it out. Because there was no hurdle of coach then. I was pretty much by myself over there working out. So after a couple of days, I finally got my three steps down. And I was actually running. You know, in between the hurdles. And so not breaking stride at all. Not breaking stride at all. So he put me into a meet. And um, if I remember correctly, I think I ran like a, a, a 15 7, right? He was like, You just qualify for districts, <laughs> right? So, long, long story short, that became my niche, right? The hurdles became my niche. And I ended up becoming a district champion in the 10th grade. Mm. Went to regionals, became the regional champion, and then took. A fifth place finish in states as a sophomore. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so I was all state as a sophomore, and then between um, tenth grade and eleventh grade year, you know, I grew a couple inches. You know, became a standout wide receiver and defensive back on the football team. So I started getting looks, you know, from like I was saying, like Wake Forest, uh, University of Virginia, um, Marshall University. Um, had a couple of mid majors at the time: Liberty, James Madison. And um, had some Ivies in there too. Grades were fairly decent, but not the greatest, right? They were, they were good enough to get D one offers. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because the, the the recruiter from Wake Forest he didn't realize I was in the tenth grade. He walked past me when uh, he walked past me on. I was on my way to the locker room. He had just got finished meeting with the coach, and he said, "Hey, you Monroe?" I said, "Yes, sir." He said, how, how, and I'm not, "How are you?" He didn't tell me who he was. He said, "Just get your math grade up." <laughs> <laughs> so, so, strange adults telling you to get your math grade. Yeah, I need you to get your algebra grade up. I mm. said, oh, okay. And I didn't think none of it, right? And I get to, I get to the uh, locker room, and uh, coach is like, hey, you know, uh, Wake Forest was just here to ask about you. I was like, so that was that guy that just asked me about getting my math grade up? He's like, yeah, that was probably him. So, so you know, we had that. And then, um, you know, 11th grade year ended up being an All-America year uh, where I ranked um, number four 
On the 300 or 110 uh, this, or both? This was an indoors. Indoors. Okay. So I, I ran indoor track and um, I clocked a 7.4 hmm. in the, in the uh, 55 meter high hurdles. And um, that was a, um, that was all, that was fourth in the nation that year. Wow. And then, uh, of course, that qualified me for, you know, outdoor nationals. And um, just for context, what you said 7.4? Yeah. What's seven, the world record in that? Um, oh, wow. I'm not sure, but I can tell you. Like, I think, I think the, I think seven five won it for high school this in last year. Okay. Yeah. So my time now probably would have won it this year. Just kind of give you some context. Right. Um, so uh, I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, we were just better than you guys. We were like, just stronger and bigger. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> but yeah. So, um, but kind of give you context. I, th- I think the world record in that is. It, well, it's different because in high school, the world record would be at the collegiate level. Right. At the collegiate level, the, 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 the hurdles are higher. Oh, okay. So in the high school, it's just kind of the high school record, I think, is like a 7-1. Okay. 7-2, something like that. So, in fact, on that national team, um, in my heat, the finals heat, there was Tiki Barber. Really? Yeah, Tiki Tiki was, um, yeah, we, I ran, in fact, I ran against Tiki quite a bit. Hmm. Um, because anytime there was a major invitational in the state of Virginia, Tiki was a year be- below me. So um, at any given moment, you know, the top the top four hurdlers in the country, three of them were from Virginia. That's crazy. So anytime I was I would see Fred Miles from Greenville, I would see Tiki Barber from, you know what I'm saying, Cave Spring out of Roanoke. Right. And then, of course, I had myself, right? And I think it was another guy that was a uh, guy named, uh, I think his name was... Um, he went to a school out of Winchester called Handley. Okay. This guy was a was a monster. You know what I'm saying? So at any given time, I would see these guys at an invitation. So you was like having nationals, you know, uh, right there. So, you know, but um, senior year was discouraging because you know I was I was ranked to you know basically win the state. I was a state champion my junior year indoors. I was picked to be state champion uh, indoors and outdoors my senior year. And you know injuries, you know back backs, you know. Uh, what do you call it? stress fractures, mm. stuff like that. So any kind of looks that I had collegiately dissipated. Oh, uh, it's you know what I'm saying. It's rough. So, you know, so I, so that's when the University of Lynchburg or Lynchburg College at the time guy guy by the name of Jack Toms, he was like, you know, we're D three, we you know we can give you grants and aid. You know, what I'm saying, wouldn't well, necessarily be a scholarship, but you won't pay any money. Right. So they set it up for me to go to you know to Lynchburg, and so I went there. And the cool thing about Lynchburg was that. Um, even though it was a D3 school, we ran against North Carolina. We ran against Duke. We ran against Virginia Tech. We ran mm. against all of these big ACC schools Yeah, because they were a D3 powerhouse, you know. And um, when I got there, they had won like the um, – it's the Old Dominion Athletic Conference. Sure. Um, Rand- Randolph-Macon. Randolph-Macon, yeah. yeah. So Bridgewater, you know, Hampton Sydney, you know. So we had basically won the, the conference title probably 10 out of the last 15 years. Mm. So, you know, when I came on board, it was like, you know, they were already established. And so we did a, did a, did a freshman year there and was uh, – did, did you play football there? Ran track. Just track. Football team. Right. Oh, they didn't have a football didn't team. Didn't have a football team. Wow. Which was interesting because I always thought the football would be my thing, but it ended up being track. And so once, once the abs and everything and the back got together, I was able to run track there. And it um, was all ODAC my freshman year in the hurdles. And then my sophomore year, I actually won the title, won the conference. Hmm. Um, so if you look in the record books, you will see my name as conference champion for the ODAC. You That's know? cool. Yeah, it's a one ten. But you know, Lynchburg College, and so when we start talking about race relations and things like that, I experienced racism for the first time. Really? At a ma- in a major way when I went to school there. So you had experienced it in minor ways prior to that, but I mean, Charlottesville was such a such a small closely connect uh closely connected community a lot of my childhood friends from you know like middle school on up they're still my friends today and they were white or black or white whatever or black. You didn't care. Mean, it was yeah. just we didn't really care of course like in middle school you know they had this this click called the reds i guess that i guess that was short for rednecks right but they called themselves the reds right you know what i'm saying but you know uh you know even those guys were cool you know what I'm saying? Was Charlottesville yeah. High School diverse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlottesville High School was great. Like it was, it was ultra diverse. You know, like I, like a lot of the friends that I that I had, man. It's like 
I'm still friends with him to this day. Like, yeah. we just, hey, what's up? What are you up to? You know? And you're talking like knowing these people pretty much more than half your life. Yeah. You know? So then when you think about the, the crap that went on in there, like, back in, um, what was it, 2017? Like, yeah. that's not the Charlottesville I knew. That's not Charlottesville yeah. I knew either. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not. Like, now, now, keep in mind, there are some, like, kind of, you know, forces at play mm-hmm. when you start to get out there in the workforce and stuff like that where, you know, African-Americans there kind of are limited in terms of what they're, what what uh, sort of opportunities that they can kind of achieve for themselves. So you almost have to leave and, you know, get, you know, get to a point where you got a certain level of status and economic viability and then come back. But growing up as a kid, I really didn't see it. But you saw it at Lynchburg. Oh God, did I see it at Lynchburg? Can you describe one? one it was. Of those ways? It was. It was a. Um, it was a. Um, it was a certain type of pressure. You know what I'm saying? It was like. It's like me. I'm. I'm a. If you know, if you've been a Capital One, you got, you know all know about the Myers Briggs testing. Sure. I'm a feeler. I perceive things. I feel. I feel the energy. Right. And so it wasn't always necessarily about what was said, but it was the look. It was the uh, certain decisions being made. It was, um, you know, I, I would have a certain situation that would happen on campus that I would get blamed for, and it wasn't necessarily my fault. Mm-hmm. But I'm the one getting kicked off of campus. So I think we would call that disparate treatment, yeah. unconscious bias. I mean, if you want to throw a term at it now, currently. Um, and, of course, I mean, I, I didn't make it easy on myself because I was a hellraiser down there. Right. You know what I'm saying? But... At the end of the day, it was like, um, you know, it was a, it was um, r- racism and unconscious bias and, and or willful bias. is not something that you can always put your finger on. You just know it when you see it, right? right? You just kind of you, you you feel it. You know what's going on, and it's like it's not like it was back in the '60s or or, or Jim Crow South where it was more in your face. It was overt back then. It was though. overt, right? So it's like. So, so, so at Lynchburg, I kind of experienced things like, well, how come this white guy from Maine gets, you know, the opportunity for you all to buy him track shoes, but then when I need track shoes, I can't get me track shoes. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Like, like, help me understand that. Well, I'm like, doesn't. I mean, we're both on the same team, right? How come you can't? How come the program can't fund my equipment, but you funded his? Yeah. Stuff like that. Right. And I was like, I'm not running until you buy me some new shoes. I said, I'm not coming to practice. I'm not doing anything. So I kind of, you know, kind of, and I not told anybody this. You might get Malcolm X. You might get Martin Luther King, or you might get Marcus Garvey with me, depending upon the day, or you might get all three in one. Hmm. Because, you know, my family is such that we're no nonsense, right? And if you look in the history books, and I know you said you were a history buff, you'll see examples of like, for example, I have a story about my great grandfather standing up to Theodore Roosevelt. Over some hunting dogs. There's, it's a documented story. I have another story of, you know, some uncles of mine who were enslaved on Monticello Mountain for uh, on Thomas Jefferson's plantation, you know, basically taking slave catchers and beating them up and tossing them into a river. Oh. These are documented stories. And so I kind of have that, you know, kind of makeup of a revolutionary, so to speak, on the inside of me naturally. So when I see things that don't feel right or they feel like they're injustice. You call it out. I call it out. Yeah. And I'm like. And I'm, and I'm unapologetic about it, you know. And so Lynchburg was interesting for me because then I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm getting mistreated in certain kind of ways, but it wasn't something I could, like, actually put my finger on. And then it was a situation where, um, which led to me leaving the college. Uh, I was at a party, and I was hanging out, doing what, you know, college students do. I, I know me, what I was doing, yeah. Yeah, I found me a nice young lady I was sharing a beer with, and, you know, it was just... Have, and she happened to be white, you know, and so somebody approached me because I was the only black guy in the party and I was having a conversation with this, you know, fairly attractive Italian white woman, you know, that I was hoping to spend some time with. Sure. You know? Yeah. And um, so why are you talking to our women? Oh, oh yeah. Excuse and so me. I was like, I said, excuse me. She said, why are you talking to my women? Our women. Mm. I was like, you know, and, those, and, and of course, I'll keep it PG, but I, I know in certain terms, I basically made it clear, get the hell out of my face. Right. Like, you know, it's none of your business. The guy spits on me. Oh, oh my, my gosh. So without thinking. Did you go to, <laughs> did you go to his funeral? Well, <laughs> so it was, it was, 
when I, when I say I, I clocked the guy, it was like probably a, it was a perfect punch because he didn't see it coming, and I knocked him out cold. One punch. One punch, and he's he's on the ground with his fist balled up. Like, he he, like, he deserved that punch. Oh yeah, after that spit, I mean that's like you know, God, I mean that's, that's you can't degrade punch. another person for it any worse. Yeah, so yeah. you know, I, I hit this guy, and next thing you know. I had to fight out of that party because apparently he was a fraternity. He was in a fraternity. I forget the name of it. But his fraternity brothers came to his aid, so I had to fight my way out of that party. And so when I get back to... So this was an off-campus situation. So when I get back to campus, a mob forms demanded that I come out of my dorm. It was at least 50 of them. This is 19... This is 1994. Hmm. And so I'm like, oh, crap. That had to be, that had to be scary. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, you know, like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. So I'm calling, like, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, so where's security? And so security, you know, they basically breaks it, break it up. But then I'm the one that got the honor violation yeah. for an off-campus incident that I was spat upon. And I got sent home until the honor board hearing. And then so I come So back. you were effectively suspended. Yeah. So, and I'm like, okay, well, the guy spit on me. You know what I'm saying? What? Was I supposed to just take that and walk away? I mean, nobody, nobody would. Nobody would. Yeah, I mean, of course, the forty-eight-year-old me now would be like, okay, well, it's probably a different way I could have handled it. Of course, I could have probably headed it off and just left. But you, why? Now you put him in a headlock. You probably wouldn't. Or, or, or whatever, right? But it's you, choke, like, you choke him out now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like you know, but when you think about that scenario, I got kicked out of school, and it wasn't you know in my mind today. I'm like, wow, I got spat on. You know, and then I was basically railroaded out of school. What would you tell your kids to do, your boys to do? I would first tell my kids, well, at least what I tell them now is, I'm like, there's two separate standards for African Americans and white people or white men. This is in most situations. In most situations, there are there are two sets of rules. I mean, I didn't create it. It's just the world we live in, And and be that what it is, it's just what it is. But my goal for you is to get you home. Right. Right? So when you're in a situation like that and it's going left, I need you to leave. Just walk away. Leave. Because yeah. don't let ego get you in a situation that you probably will hurt you long term or get you in a situation that you can't get out of. Right? And like anytime there's a scenario, for example, like when you see these these shootings and, you know, they're on video and you know, there's always, and I always tell my kids, even though that cop may have been in, in the wrong for, you know, taking a life or whatever have you, there's always at a certain point that you can say, okay, well, maybe if that person didn't push the issue any further, maybe there could have been a way for him to get out of that scenario. So the goal for my kids, that what I teach them, and in, in, in African American families, we all have that talk. Unfortunately, it's it's the world we live in. I have to have that talk with my kids. Like when you're out, it's yes sir, it's no sir, or yes ma'am, or no ma'am, and you do everything you need to do to make sure you maintain your safety until you get home, and then we can deal with how you were treated. Right. 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 Yeah. And that way, you know, you live to fight on another day because, like, and I tell my kids, and I tell other young men that I mentor, you know, you can't you can't be you can't expect for police officers or whoever else or, or figures that, that are basically enforcing some rule of some sort to basically be the judge and the jury at that particular moment. You always have a time to kind of state your case. Right. And it's important to remember that when you're in those types of scenarios because that could be a matter of life and death for you because of your skin color. Because of, again, unconscious bias and a, and a fear or whatever else that you're dealing with somebody that pretty much, with if they have a weapon, they have some some level of authority over top of yeah. them. Yeah, they 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 are in a position of advantage. Right. Yeah. So, mm. so anyway, that that Lynchburg thing, you know. So um, I eventually got kicked out of school, and you know the the Marine Corps, you know, was up next. Then, well, know, was that like a wow? What do I do now? I have no idea what I'm going to do. And well, well, it's it's interesting because I was always infatuated with the Marine Corps, okay. so I had already signed the contract anyway to do a delayed entry program. Oh, you signed when, when you got out of high school. Yeah. So, you know, so that, that following year in 93, 94, I was supposed to go to the basic. And so it made it made that transition a lot easier being that I was going to be out of school. 
You know, they allowed me to finish up my sophomore year, run track, of course, because I was picked to win the conference. Right. Of course, that, that would have given them, I think, their 12th conference title or something. So I ran, you know. But after that, they were to- they told me that I needed to uh, undergo psychological evaluation before I can be readmitted. Because you punched somebody after you were spit on? Mm-hmm. 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 That makes so people say, sense. So people say, you know, racism doesn't exist. Just, I'd like to meet the people that say that because I don't know people that say. That. I mean, of course it exists. And, and in, this, in this particular case, this what this became more. This became a structured outcome, versus it being um, a situation where it was like you know, um, hey, you spin on somebody. Now they're trying to blackball me from going to other schools because now, like you know, it's like um, now you're showing them a record that I was actually expelled because of violence. But you don't necessarily have the, the the background as to why it happened. You only see the outcome. But the outcome was basically overstated. Or it, it the, the, the reasons for it was overstated because at the end of the day, I was spat on. Yeah. Right? I was called nigger. I was called this. I was called that. I was basically bum-rushed in a party, had to fight my way out of there because I was talking to a young white woman. It's an, it's an untenable position that you're in. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, how do you, and then of course you're talking about a 19 year old kid, like, like, and I keep in mind, Charlottesville was not like that. Like, right. I didn't go through that in school. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Hell yeah. Get to college, is a whole other world, and it's like, wow, like how do I, how do I navigate this? Yeah, so, that's tough. the ball my fist up. <laughs> no, I, you know, if so. I, if I was you, I, I probably would have done the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so Marine Corps, uh, tell, tell us one f- story that you remember, good or bad, from basic. Um, <laughs> funny story. Um, of course, I told you about life on the farm and everything like that. And, you know, these these uh, drill instructors were just trying to basically break us, you know. And I'm like. Break you down so they can build you back up, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the story. But, you know, you could tell those kids that had pretty good in life, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, they were raised pretty good and. You know, we had this one one recruit. His last name was Adamo. He was a real small guy, and they did. They always put us in the squad bay from ta- smallest to the lo- to the tallest. Why do they do that? For marching purposes. Okay. So when you're doing drill, you know, what I'm saying because okay. you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? All, I think I was number forty-two, which ended up being my college jersey number. Now that I think about it, um, I was number forty-two um, in a squad of like 62, 63 recruits. So, recruiter Damo, the, 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 the drill instructors came in and it was getting really crazy. And so, the way the Marine Corps is set up with their barracks and everything, you have your bunks and then you have foot lockers. I'm not sure how they do it in the Army, but we had, we had foot lockers. And, you know, basically, you, you had all your gear there, your stamps and your envelopes. Same way. You know what I'm saying? And so, they took Adamo's stuff out of his foot locker and they said, get in the foot locker, get in the foot locker. And Adamo got in this foot locker. <laughs> the, and wait bent a minute, down. The, the, the drill instructors instruct- are telling him to do it? Told him to get in this foot locker. <laughs> <laughs> and because he was small, he was, I mean, I kid you not, the guy was probably soaking wet, 125 pounds. Bad. Probably five foot four, five foot three. Wow. Get in your foot locker, get in your foot locker. And this this guy was like, I yes, sir, I sir, I sir. And he and he was in his foot locker trying to try to shut it <laughs> and i'm sitting back like it, it, it was and, and i kid you not it, it was the funniest thing in the world to me you know because i was i had the um i got the uh i got the title early on in basic training of being the individual right because no matter what they did i didn't care right monroe get on my quarter deck let me see how many push-ups you can do you're supposed to be a big football star because I had the Citadel actually come down to recruit me while I was in basic. Oh wow! I had a, I had an army, I had an army captain, which is the excuse me, a navy captain, which is the equivalency of a colonel, right? In the Marine Corps. Yep. And so there was a colonel, I mean, a navy captain that came with some some newspaper clippings and stuff like that, wanted to get it to my attention. So they had heard about it, how about me being down there, and they wanted to make a play for it. So the guy had me pushing, and I was just doing push-ups all day, whatever, right? But that all changed when I got the swim qual. And they made us go swimming with, like, all of this gear. Yeah. The combat gear and everything like See that. See if you're going to freak out. So I jump in the water, you know, nothing to it. Do my swim qual thing. I'm, I'm okay. I think, I, I think what is it, S3 or something like that. It was, um, it's different levels to swim qual in the military. So I think I was, you know, 
I could have, you know, I pretty much was high. Yeah, you were high. You were definitely high enough. So I got out the water, and I'm what they call diddy bopping, diddy bopping back to the squad. So we in the Marine Corps, we are we get swim call trained by Navy SEALs, right? And so Navy SEAL walks up, says, "Lock your body." So I'm standing at attention, you know. What's up? And he's like, okay, okay. He said, we got a live one here. <laughs> he said, okay. He said, son. He said, um, have you ever killed a man? I said, what? He said, have you ever killed a man? Do you know what that's like? I was like, no, nah, I ain't never killed nobody. <laughs> well, why are you asking <laughs> me that? What kind of question is that? Yeah. And this guy, I kid you not, when you looked in his eyes, there was no life in his eyes. Yeah, he, this he, guy was the real deal. Yeah. yeah, he was the real deal. Now, I, I, I keep in mind, I've never feared any man. I didn't fear him, but it was like he's like he said. He said he said we're in the business of where we have to take lives. And he said, "What you're doing here is preparing you for that, if it comes to that." And he said, if you don't get yourself in line, I'm going to show you a world of hurt that you've never seen before. This is a SEAL telling you that. This is a Navy SEAL. Mm. You don't want that world. <laughs> Not at the time. Now, by the time basic was over and we get into the fleet, and I mean, I'm hard as nails. I'm ready to go. And then, But, you know, that, that time, that was a wake-up call, man. I'm like, good God, this guy has no life in his eyes. Now, I've been in the street. I've seen what guys look like that's done some, some crazy stuff. And this guy had that look times 100. Yeah, he was he was a rough character, man. Mm. I could tell. I know I don't know this guy's name to this day, this Navy SEAL's name to this day, but that at that particular point, I took everything serious at that point. And yeah, I had an effect on you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, this guy was uh hardcore, man. He's got hard as nails. What was, your, as nails. what was your specialty in the Marine Corps? I was uh I was a O three eleven, so I started off in the grunts, and then I ended up going into scout recon. Oh, okay. So. That's why I said, I'm like, at the time, yeah, but then after a while, when I got into it, I'm like, okay, I got what he was saying. You know what I'm saying? Um, I was in scout recon and um, got out the, with the rank of sergeant. So I did uh, I did six years uh, faithful service. And then I had two years of inactive service. One year was spent at Lynchburg. Okay. Can inactive you, service. Can you explain scout recon for the um, military? So, so, so when you got, so you got force recon. Mm-hmm. That's and special ops for the Marine Corps. Special ops for the Marine Corps. And then you got Scout Recon, which we basically are in the same family. Great the bush cover, right? Um, so Scout Recon is about snooping, what we refer to as snooping poop, right? Meaning I was trained to sneak up on you. Oh. And I could be within five feet of you and never know I was there. So that's the type of training that we received. Oh, yeah, some tic tacs in your pocket. <laughs> well, uh, primarily, and you tell me where I'm wrong here, yeah. George. They go out and they report. They recon. They recon. Uh, recon and surveil, and then they're they're the eyes and ears effectively for the main unit. And so, if they get into some bad stuff because they have to defend themselves, that's yeah. that's one thing. But they try not to, to right. get into the right. So the you're not engaging. You're just checking stuff out. But you can get up close enough to check stuff out. I, I, I give you. I give you. I give you an idea. Um, Paul would know this. We were in a hide, okay, had my suit on, and I had a squirrel <laughs> walk up my back. He never knew I was there, and he sat there. And my squad leader was probably maybe 15 to 20 yards on the other side, and he said, my eyes got this big because I didn't know what was on my back. I was like, what the? <laughs> and um, the guy, he looked at me. He was like, he was like you're good, you're good. So they're like this, and then the squirrel felt me, and he ran off. He freaked out, probably. He, yeah. So and then and then another crazy story, man. I um that did prove that you're good at your job, though. <laughs> I had a deer walk oh up God. on me. I had a deer walk up on me because we you know we had been in down at Camp Lejeune. We were down in there, probably been in the bush, probably I don't know, going on three and a half weeks, you know. And um, of course, I probably smelled like the woods and had a deer come within five yards of me. Then he know I was there. Wow. Yeah, so so has that helped your hunting prowess and later? <laughs> well, I I tell you what, I tell you what's what's helped me quite a bit was basically the Marine Corps marksmanship. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So it's like you that know, makes sense. The Marines take uh, marksmanship very seriously. Oh yeah, oh yeah, because yeah. you know we we qualify five hundred yards mm-hmm. with no scope. Everybody's a rifleman in the Marine. Yeah, everybody's a rifleman. Even even the, even uh, 
you know, the admin guy, you know, he needs to qualify with that rifle. So, nice. yeah, it's an extension of your arm. Well, that's the way every service should be. Marine Corps takes it very seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. as they should. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so you you're out of Marine Corps and you end up going back to Charlottesville, or came back to Charlottesville. Came back to Charlottesville, and um, that was a that was a rough go, um, because like, what well, most folks they didn't call it PTSD or anything like that back then. Um, it was more or less, hey, you know, you came home and you know you got to get readjusted in, in a society. It's hard. Yeah. But, you know, I had, it's, it's kind of funny. It, the military is, is such a way where if you had issues coming into it, either you learn to cope and overcome those issues or those issues that you had coming in, in most instances, can get exacerbated. They can get larger. And in my case, they got larger. You know what I'm saying? I, like I had stuff that I dealt with. And, um, you know, I um, got home and, you know, family life wasn't wasn't right. You know, I got got caught up in some stuff, and you know, eventually, I found myself you know between a rock and a hard place. You know, and um, still dealing with mental issues, which later down the road got caught got got me caught up in a situation where I was actually charged with intent to kill, attempted murder. Um, you know, and so it was by the grace of God that going through that situation um, that. Um, the judge recognized my military service. He said that it looked like I had some issues that I needed to deal with from, from an anger management standpoint. And he basically, with the approval of the Commonwealth's attorney, bust that thing down to a simple assault and said, if you go to anger management, go through community corrections, we can help you get yourself together. So I had gotten a counselor and everything. You know what I'm saying? And it worked. And it worked. It really did. And then, of course, that it also helped that I got into got deeper into my faith. You know what I'm saying? That was a big driver of that as well. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I had I had some real challenges, you know, and this is you talking around kind of like that 97, 98 time frame right. when I got got to Richmond. You know, I was pretty much homeless and I was trying to figure things out, got into school and I was still wrestling with some things, trying to get myself together. But I eventually ended um, in 1998, you know, ended up getting a, a bachelor's degree from the Virginia Union uh, in sociology. Let's, let's back up a little bit. Yeah, sure. So you end up coming to Richmond. Yeah, came and, to Richmond. And you had already been accepted to the Union. Yep. You were going to play football. I was going to try to play football. So you were a walk-on. I was a walk-on. Nobody knew you were coming. Nobody knew I was all right, coming. All right, t- Never even you heard snuck of up on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> walked in. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I skipped the whole section there. Yeah, I walked, I walked up to the... Uh, to Hovey Field, they had the coach's offices there at the time in a trailer. And uh, there's a guy there by the name of William Dillon. Uh, you know, in fact, he was number 42. Uh-huh. So 42 is an interesting number, right? Um, you know, and uh talked to him. And I was like, hey, man, you know, I'm, I got accepted here, but I'm looking to go to school. I don't, I don't really know how I'm going to pay for it. You know, I, I guess I'm going to take out loans. But I played football in high school. I ran a little track. You know what I'm saying? I'm just getting home from the military. Is this something that you can help me with? Can you help me find... And you're 26 at this point? 25, 26? 20, 22, 23. Okay. 23. And, you know, so I'm like, hey, can you help me um, get, in, get get myself together? You know? So this guy took me across the street to the financial aid office. There was a financial aid director there by the name of Gil Powell. And he was like, hey, you know, we can help you get your money together. So he sat me down and showed me where all the different grants that I could qualify for um, he helped me with getting my GI Bill money together from the military, how to file the paperwork for that. And then, of course, um, that's probably about the smartest thing that I did is I actually had money coming out of my check for in case I wanted to go to school. Right. And then, of course, VA had the VA had a benefit for you if you were trying to get a degree. Right. That you can actually get money. I think it was like $300 a month. Montgomery GI Bill. The Montgomery, yeah. Yeah. So they helped me get all of that stuff together and then of course um like i was ta- telling you about the the homeless situation i left charlottesville because um i got into some stuff that i thought i couldn't get out of right and you know so without going into a whole lot of detail i basically left charlottesville after selling everything that i had in a yard sale you know um my mother came by and basically bought stuff that she had given me before and basically i ended up with like 200 dollars in my pocket and a duffel bag so you, you left town with 200 bucks and, 200 bucks. and enough stuff to fit in a duffel bag. I had a friend up here um, in Richmond that said she had a, she knew a friend that would allow me to, you know, stay on this couch. 
I gave him 150 bucks, kept 50 for myself, and then hello world, you mm-hmm. know, sink or swim, you know, and um, so, you know, going to school, you know, I got a chance to walk onto the football team. I wasn't the star I was in high school and everything like that, but after the second year, I was able to start on special teams. You know, and, and Union was, had Union had a good football team yeah, back then, and it, and it was a, well they they did, but they went a rebuild, um, mm-hmm. you know, and so it was like I had a chance to get in there, I got the degree, you know, and then um, life. Well, well, hold on, after you met Dylan, who'd you meet after that? You met I met Dylan. I met a guy named Gil Powell um, in the financial aid office, and he helped me get money together for school. Right. And then the next thing was housing. How do I where where do I lay my head? Right. So, um, coach Coach Dylan called Coach Dave Robbins, who's a legend at Union. He's a legend. Yeah, you know what? Uh, three national titles. Yeah. Uh, D D two national titles. And um, so Coach Rob comes over. He's like, so um, you know, he talks like this, you no know, big <laughs> Southern draw. He was like, how can I help you, young man? I was like, well, Coach, uh, I was like, you know, I, I just got accepted to school here, but I don't have a place to live. And I was like, I don't have money to pay for the dorms and all of that other stuff. And I said, besides, I just recently got accepted. Um, but right now I need a place to live. You know, Coach Dill said, you might have a place for me or you have a room or something like that. He said, well, I got a, got a place behind the dorm off campus, but you can walk to your classes if you wanted, if I wanted to live there. So he set me up with the room and house. And I told him what my fun, what, what I was getting from the military, what I would, would get from the military. And he only charged me $100 a month. He could have charged you more. He could have charged me more. Yeah. He charged me hundred dollars a month to live in a room, and the, the the house has been torn down now. But like I was saying before, you know the the breeze coming through. If there's a real hard wind outside, you felt it coming through that house. No, no insulation. In the house. No insulation. It, mm. You know, and then of course, if you had too many things on at one time, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the electrical the may not have been set, not been set, yeah. not set up very well. Yeah, know. and then and then on top of that, the breaker box was in somebody else's room. So if they weren't there, then you just sat in the dark until somebody <laughs> turned the lights on. But I was thankful, you know what I'm saying. And um, you know, in Richmond, there's that Zaya flea market. Went up there and got me an old dresser. I painted it. Went to Lowe's and got me some new handles. I remember it like it was yesterday. I bought me some black paint and some gold knobs. Mm. Painted the little dresser, put the gold knobs on, brung it in. Um, went to the Isaiah Free Market and bought a mattress. Went to Kmart, I think it was, and, and got a mattress cover and a big old thing of Lysol. Sprayed the mattress down real good. Packaged that up, got me a set of sheets. And then there it was. And I went to school and I lived there for a year. <laughs> went lived there for a year. And, um, you know, the young lady that helped me, you know what I'm saying, hook up with a friend of hers. I ended up getting into a relationship with her, and then we ended up getting pregnant. Uh-huh. You know, so you know, from from being homeless to now I'm a now I'm a dad. Yeah, and Kyle is trying to make it work. So that 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 opportunity at Virginia Union actually became two full seasons, but then I had to stop playing football because then I became a dad. And then going up 64 West, there was that sign one eight hundred seven seven hire one. I need a job. I need benefits. And you just graduated? I was still working. I was still, I was still, it was, this was probably 98 at the time. Okay. 97, 90, yeah, 97. Um, and my little girl was just born and she's probably six months old. And I'm like, okay, I can't play ball anymore. I need to wrap this degree up. I need to get a job. And saw the Capital One sign. We call it the bakery on this podcast. The yeah. bakery? The yeah. bakery. Yeah. yeah. So, so my bad. Uh, no, no, you're good. You, yeah. you didn't know. So yeah, so the bakery. So I saw the bakery for you know for the uh, the phone number to work at the bakery. So <laughs> so um, I got the job and was making nineteen thousand dollars a year and working over at Westmoreland in the call center. Wait a minute, you were making nineteen? I was only making eighteen too. <laughs> yeah, so was I. How that Nin- work? Nineteen five. Maybe I smile real big. Um, so yeah, so from that point on, I then got me a one bedroom apartment. Over off of Chamberlain Avenue in Richmond's North Side, mm-hmm. and I lived there, and um, you know, and then of course the relationship with the the mother didn't work out, so then I became a single dad from oh, the time my daughter was seven months old. So you you raised her, I raised her, my, wow. her whole life. Now back to the bakery real quick. Yeah, uh, are you to blame for bringing uh, Terry Chisley and Daryl McCaddy over there? Or was it the other way around? 
Uh, <laughs> I forgot those jokers worked there with me. Yeah, they was all there when I got there, yeah, so it's, it's, it's their fault. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember Daryl. I, I remember Daryl. I'm fond of Daryl. Yeah, yeah, man. So you know, Virginia Union was, um, you know, was a launching pad for me. Despite the issues, despite what I was going through, you know, what I'm saying, like as I mentioned, um, the court charges, they saw, they saw what I was doing, what I was trying to, you know, accomplish, and then of course, um. That was a wake up call to me to kind of deal with my my interpersonal issues, and and get those things squared away, um, to the point that I can actually become functioning. Now I won't I won't say sit here and say that I'm all the way there, um, but you know I don't I don't have it in my mind to go try to take somebody out anymore. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, and um, you know, it took also my wife, my second wife. You know what I'm saying? Because um, Got married the first time. I'm still dealing with those issues. I mean, I would tell anybody, uh, my hat goes off to any spouse that's married to a serviceman or a former serviceman because there's things that go on that that are necessarily, you know, in the home that most folks probably wouldn't even realize. And the spouse doesn't understand all of it either, but they're trying to do their best. They're trying to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? And so... You know, my first wife, you know, she she tried the best that she could to to try to figure it out with me and it just didn't work out. But then it took my my second wife, who I met in 2002, to really challenge me to go get additional help, counseling and things like that to really work through some things. You know what I'm saying? And once again, it worked. It worked. It's working. Yeah. I would say it's work in progress. I would say it's working because, um, like I said, a lot of stuff that I that I kind of deal with, you know, part military, part upbringing, too. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Like like I was saying, life on that farm was hard. And, you know, I don't really talk a lot about, like, some of the things I had to go through. But you also got to put things in this proper context when you're dealing with people who were, what, a stone's throw from slavery and how they were treated. And I think about those types of lessons that they basically had to deal with on their own and they're getting passed down to other generations. Right. And it's to kind of give you the context, right? My grandmother was, my great-grandmother was born in 1900. You know, her mother was born in, I think it was the 18, late 1870s. So her grandmother was a slave. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so think yeah. about those, the harsh realities that they had to face that, you know, that I'm now exposed to, even though there's longevity there. Right. Because, you know, she was well in her 70s and 80s when I was born and she lived to be 99. Right. So, you know, you deal with that stuff coming up and then you try to, I don't know package it into a modern world that you're trying to navigate for yourself but then you overlay that stuff with your military experience and stuff like that like then you know it 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 can be a lot if you and one thing that servicemen are really good at is compartmentalizing because you never really fully deal with it but you do tuck it away you know what i'm saying you tuck it away yeah and what i what i found for myself is sometimes um (laughs) Certain smells, certain looks, certain positions, certain interactions, it triggers something. And I have, oh, I have to recognize what that is and then I have to quickly recover. You know what I'm saying? To, to make sure I'm yeah. not overthinking it. Yeah. Yep. Right? So, yeah, hopefully, you know, this is what you all wanted from this podcast. No, yeah, you're good, man. <laughs> Absolutely. That's brilliant. Um, you're, but yeah, so, so, now, so now it's like I'm navigating the corporate America, I'm navigating all that comes with that, and then I'm wrestling with, I won't call them demons, that's a strong word, but I'm wrestling with these things, uh, these experiences, you know, um, uh, you know, trying to, like, how do I navigate these things, and then, then you start to think about, like, you know, the structured racism and stuff that exists within even corporate America, and then it's like, how do I navigate this when I know I should be here, but I'm, like, kind of feeling here, and there's a ceiling here, and I need to make more money for my family, but so and so won't let me because they keep screwing me with certain ratings, and they're building a paper trail that doesn't necessarily make sense. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Ma'am. So, and I went through that at the bakery for 18 years. Yeah. You know, and then I, only to leave, and then actually within five years, actually be making what I should have been making 10 years prior. You know, you kind of live and learn, yeah. um, but you know, it's uh. It's interesting, you know, and then then you think about like um, speaking purely as an African-American male, you think about then everything that's kind of going on around you, you know, like the the social unrest, um, 
the black on black stuff, the, the, the white fragility, the black fragility, you know, um, the news cycles. It's like, like, how do you even... It can be overwhelming. It, it is overwhelming, actually. It, it, is, it is overwhelming because it's like... Um, I, I, I tell my I tell my my wife and my I just I tell her I said I just want to breathe, man. Like I just want to I just want to I just want to uh, even playing field. You know, sometimes I, it's like um, I, and I don't know. I might even have it, but it's because of those those experiences. It's like I doubt that I do, but I might. It might be there for me, right? You, you might have an even playing field, and you and you doubt, but, but that, subconsciously, that it's, yeah. it's like. Okay, now that then that is an anxiety thing, right? So, they say that the number one killer of black men is stress. The, I believe it. The second one is at the hands of another black male, mm. right? Mm. And so it's like I remember being twenty five and and on my birthday saying, "Man, I made it," wow. and that's crazy, that but is. that's the reality. Yeah, you know. Wow. Um, and then, then when I think about, for example, um, the stress thing, like. Like how do I how do I keep myself grounded to the point where I'm not my head is not going to explode, and so that's that's a common reality for me right now. Like how do I do that, and then also how do I also influence change? How do I also affect change in my in my local community and my surroundings? So that way I want to be a part of the solution and not just complain about the problems that are out there. So being a handover, I, I guess you both know about. The issues going on with the school board and then, of course, the, the lack of diversity with the board of supervisors um, and then the different topics that are coming up. I mean, I, I ride down um, 33 a lot. I see the, the Tea Party signs. Some of them I agree with. The, the other ones I'm like, damn, like, like, like for real, like really, yeah. especially anything that's kind of like, for example, um, I think there's one where they show like the, the bodies of the servicemen and they're blaming it all on President Biden. But anybody that's been involved in any sort of like you know military operation, you know that there's a million and one things that can go wrong. Yeah. And Biden is seven hundred levels away from what happened. As far as so it's like, so then it's like you know those things um, you know trigger other thoughts. It's like, like how do I how do I um, be a part of the solution? Like how do I try to build inroads? So the work that I'm doing, you know, like and we've talked with Kevin about like some of the. You know, the genealogy work and how that's kind of bled over to some social um, justice, equity and, uh, you know, inclusion work that I'm involved in currently on how that all kind of plays. So I look at my life and my general experiences around, you know, like leaving the farm, uh, going into Charlottesville, having a kind of type of upbringing from that point on, going to college the first time, kind of going through that, uh, going into the military and then coming back coming back to an all-black school, which has got its own sort of, like, nuances that I had to navigate to because I'm like, whoa, like, I went from one pendulum to the all the way to the other pendulum, and that, I'm not really certain I like this pendulum either as far as some of the dynamics there. Mm. Um, and then, of course, becoming a single parent and trying to figure that out <laughs> and then trying to figure out my career. And, Lots like, stages. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up, <laughs> seriously, because, like, everything has been more reactive, right? And you think about... Um, uh, uh, one of the counselors that I had, um, he talked, he used this term, um, a human being versus a human doing. And I realized for a lot of my life, it was been about being a human doing because I had to basically be in survival mode. Mm. And now that I'm in an actual, I'm in a, I'm in an opportunity to be able, now I'm being able to, uh, I'm positioning myself now to be able to thrive. Right. But how, because if you've been spending the majority of your life in a situation where you're just trying to move on to the next thing to try to keep yourself sane and take care of those responsibilities around you. But now, they're in the, well, you know, I look back, I'm like, ah, I really don't have any pressures. But then it's like, well, how do I enjoy that? Right. Yeah. And that's not, this is not anything new for me. I mean, as far as uh, being an African-American, I think the vast majority of African-American males feel that way when you have, when you achieve a certain, certain level of attainment. Now you have to figure out how do I enjoy that? Because that's not taught. You're yeah. taught to survive. Yeah. So, George, I can't transition smoothly to the next thing. <laughs> but go ahead and ask your uh, late night talk show. Question. All right. Yeah, uh, here we go. The big uh, end of the pot. Well, almost end of the podcast question. Yeah. So, tonight you are a late night talk show host. Mm-hmm. You've got one show to do. 
you can pick a male guest, a female guest, a musical group, and a comedian. And it can be dead or alive. It can be anybody in the world. It could be somebody in your family. You can just be going for ratings. You can have me on there. You can be hey, you, whatever you, you want. You can be thought provoking. By the way, nobody's ever picked Kevin to be on their <laughs> talk show. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Uh, so you talk about the transition. The person that I would interview would be James Monroe. Okay. The president. Yeah, that's a good one for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I would interview him because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to tease it after you. Yeah, because uh, yeah. because when you think about him, like. We talked a little bit before, like going live about um, like some of the work that I'm involved in and, you know, really about social justice, equity and how do you actually begin the conversation around race? Because it's nuanced. It's um, it's not simple. It's it's complex. It's ugly. It's painful. But it has to be. So if you think about from a history standpoint, Paul, we talk about you being a history buff. The idea of race relations has been something that's been kicked down the proverbial American road mm-hmm. since the Revolutionary War. Yeah. About what to do with this African problem. <laughs> and it was and then it really didn't come to a head until the Civil War, but even then after that, there were different kind of threads that kind of pushed it along. Right? And then other kind of secondary and search uh, uh Secondary, and then of course, you know, you got other kind of paths that have layered onto it that's now made this problem even more kind of like confusing and um, uh, nuanced. I'm gonna use that word again. Monroe had an opportunity where, even though he owned 250 enslaved people in his life, he still tried to promote the, the, the country of Liberia in Africa in Monrovia, where he was sending. Africans who wanted to return back to Africa, he wanted to send them back there. So you have one, you have him and Jefferson were interesting because they, they didn't, they looked at, they looked at slavery as a necessary evil and they both in their own way try to do something about it, but yet they benefited from its institution. They wildly benefited from it. Let's be clear. They wildly wildly benefited benefited from it. And Mm -hmm. so when I think about Monroe and I think about like doing the reason why I got into genealogy, because I was trying to figure out what made me tick. I was trying to figure out why my family and the generations before me treated me the way they did. Yeah. And was there some level of hurt in their lives that caused them to be who they were? And so by doing that, I wanted to learn a lot about those that came before me. And that journey has kept that's took me back to 1780 ish. I learned about the different snapshots of these people and having oral, fish, oral family histories and stuff like that because I wanted to understand my makeup, what what's what sort of things kind of make me up and who I am today. I wouldn't trade experience on the farm for nothing, but because it makes me who I am. Mm-hmm. But I want I want to understand that type of experience and why it happened the way it did, and being in such cl- close proximity to. Um, African chattel slavery in Virginia, in Charlottesville, by two American presidents interchangeably, right? Uh, one was a mentor to the other. How does all of that kind of flow into who I am today as an African American male in the 21st century? And how do I use that to grow? Yeah. And hopefully he'll start the conversation, the broader conversation on race. So it's a very complicated answer. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it, but it, but it's one that I think that p- depending upon which tre- thread you pull, it could be so enlightening, right? Mm. So um, I, I I neglected to mention that once I left Virginia Union, I went to University of Richmond and got a master's degree. Okay. And focused it on uh, liberal arts with a focus in history, and so the topic of my kind of thesis, per, as you will, was. 19th century racial ideology and how it set the stage to modern day legal disparity, right? And so the interesting thing is I became a fan, not a fan, but I, I became a, interest, a, a huge fan of the interest, so to speak, of Robert E. Lee. Because most people will tell you who Robert E. Lee was during the Civil War, but they won't talk to you about who he was before and after. You know, a commandant at West Point as a colonel, he had an opportunity to fight for the North. He didn't. Reason being is because what? Virginia was considered a country state back then. So think about Puerto Rico, right? And say I choose a general from Puerto Rico to say I want you to serve 
and my army, and now I want you to go back and invade Puerto Rico, where all your family are, your businesses, your interests. Mm-hmm. So what would you have done? So now that I'm a trained historian, I can put that in context. What would you have done if you were him? He would say, no, I'm not going to go back and you know do something that would hurt my family yeah. and my kinsmen. I get it. Okay, put things in this proper context. And then, um, so then after he fought, of course, in the South, you know, what did he do after, after you know, the, um, the war ended? Well, he became a president of Washington Lee College, right? He became a, um, an advocate to heal the nation. He, he, he encouraged, he implored his, uh, his colleagues to rejoin the union, right? Mm-hmm. And he said, put away all relics of the war so that way we can help the nation heal. Now, keep in mind, he did that for the last five years of his life as a man without a country because they had stripped him of his citizenship because he had fought for the South. So I get the idea of the lost cause narrative and all that other good stuff. And, you know, the, the daughters of the Confederacy and they put this lost cause thing out there. But if you go back to history, if you go back to primary sources, what did they say? And I understand that they still felt that, you know, Africans were inferior, that they probably should have been maintaining slavery and this and that. But you have to you have to cut it a little bit different to get a different perspective to really understand how does all of this drive today? Right. Because a lot of pieces of history are not being properly told. And we talk a little bit about how history is whitewashed. And so. When you look at the horse's mouth, who is the most revered general in the Southern, like when you think about the CSA, he is the most revered. And even he said, put away the relics, let's heal as one nation. Right? Mm-hmm. I didn't write it. You know, he did. I mean, he, he spoke it in, in his primary accounts, primary like accounts of him in his words. Mm-hmm. Now, his perspective of, of Africans at that particular time were basically the perspectives of all those men at that time. Right. That's what they knew. And I get that. Right. But it's like telling history in its proper context is the starting point to get us to where we need to be today yeah. to hopefully start to dismantle some of this racism. And, and um, you know, I, I guess the, the I guess that the, um, I like to say a lot that, you know, diversity is a misnomer because once I sit down with you, Kevin, once I sit down with you and Paul, I'm going to get to a conclusion where, you know what? You guys love your families like I love my family. You probably love to fish and hunt like I like I do. And guess what? Diversity is not no longer an issue because now we have something on common ground that we can actually relate on. Yeah. And we're relaxed. And we're yeah. So think about it. So like now now imagine if we had those types of conversations collectively around, then race hopefully at some particular point no longer becomes an issue. Gotta peep gotta get people past the color of someone's skin. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's we've come a long way. We got a long way to go. It's funny. So Beaver Dam, right? I love Beaver Dam. Been out there 15 years. We were at the Beaver Dam Quick Stop. Ran into this guy named I, I forget the guy's name. I think his name was Chuck Charles or something like that. And um, so he pulls up to the pump right next to me. This kid gets out with a Confederate hat on. He's got the Confederate shirt, right? On his bumper on his car. All across the back of the trunk and the bumper sticker, Confederate flags, heritage, not hate. Yeah. So me, I've always been a live one. I'm like, okay, okay, so okay, here we go. I was like, so I'm sitting there pumping the gas and I'm talking to him. I said, I said, um, um, listen up, uh, why you got all those stickers on your car? What's the point? Right? And he and he looked at me and he was like, he said, Sir, I don't want any problems. I'm like, I'm not here to give you any problems. I just I just want to understand exactly, you know, what are you trying to what are you trying to communicate? And he was like, Well, um, listen, man, I, I don't know where you're going with this. I said, like, Well, I just want to understand. Um, here's your opportunity to tell me why you feel like that's heritage and not hate. And he was like, Well, my grandfather told me that, you know, if anybody was to ask me why I love the South, it's because of my heritage. And I don't hate anybody, man. I don't hate you. I was like, okay. I said, but do you realize that that symbol that you that you that you're advocating is very hurtful to people that look like me? And he was like, well, I get it, but it's my heritage. I said, I said, I said, I understand. I said, I said, oh, let me ask you this: Are you from the South? He said, Yeah. I said, Where are you from? So I'm from Louisa. 
I said, okay. I said, well, you know, my mother, she's from Louisa. I said, my, 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 in fact, I said, my family's from Louisa. Like, on my mom's side, they're all from Louisa. I was like, chances are, your people, if they were slaveholders, they probably own my people. I said, well, let me ask you something even deeper than that. I was like, um, if you're from the South and it's heritage, and you talk about heritage, you're talking about culture, you're talking about societal norms and stuff like that, does that also make me a confederate? And should I share the same beliefs that you believe? Since we're both pretty much from the same area, if you're from Louisa and I'm from Louisa, then we know that they do certain things here, and my confederate as well. And he's like, man, I don't know how to answer that. I said, so, you know, what do you know about the confederacy? He said, well, I know it's about states' rights. States' rights to do what? He was like, well, um, you know, to basically farm. And I said, well, if you look at the secession documents, they all said states' rights to maintain the institution of slavery. I was like, I didn't write it. I was like, but I'm, I'm informing you just so that way you know, because if you look at all the secession documents, that's what it points to. And he just looked at me. I said, man, I'm not giving you a hard time. I said, I'm not. I said, I just, I like these types of conversations because I want to be able to understand specifically what people think, you know, and then add my two cents to it. You well, know? and you were opening his eyes too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I also wanted to be open myself because this is back when the George Floyd thing was going on. And, um, you know, the marches was happening down through my, you know, uh, on Monument Avenue and they were trying to pull the, the, the statues and everything is down. And, um, you know, and I and I told him, it's like, um, I was like, I don't know what to think because, like, I don't really care about those monuments. Like, you know, tearing the monuments down doesn't do anything about structured racism. I'm doesn't, stressed, change, doesn't change the history. Doesn't either. change history either. Right. So I'm like, why did I, I mean, I think that they should have kept it up and then added additional context to it. And he was shocked that I said that. I'm like, not everybody thinks of those monuments to come down. Like, I, I'd rather learn about them things and then maybe add some of things additional to it so that way you can tell a broader story. I'm like... Because what's worse is just not addressing it at all. Not, and, and that's all we've done. It's that proverbial kick the can down the road. Mm-hmm. So this kid couldn't have been no more than about 23, 24 years old. So I let him off the hook. Like, I was giving him some hard questions, right? Things that I wrestle with. And... um. He was like, he's like, man, I thank you for that history lesson, man. I didn't know all of that. Because we got into the Robert E. Lee thing, too, about how, you know, he wanted he he wanted to basically help heal the nation, period, That at the end of the day. And he never knew all of that, you yeah. know, that the flag was actually the Virginia battle flag, the Virginia battle flag. Like, you never we, Well, knew. we whitewashed Robert E. Lee's history. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so this guy, you know, so his, I, I think his name is Chuck. And I told him, I said, man, anytime I see you out here, I'm... I'm dapping you up. I'm gonna yeah. say hello to you. Well, he became a little more worldly after that conversation. Exactly. Too. So when we talk, so when we talk about like just having targeted conversations, you know what I'm saying? Non-offensive conversations, just real conversations where you get into it and just try to figure it out together. You know what I'm saying? I think that's the starting point, and it's also helping me understand some of the things that I went through as well. Right? Not talking about it's so definitely not gonna help. Yeah, that's just. Yeah. That's a cop out, as far as I'm concerned. All right, we're back to the talk show. Yeah. We're gonna give you two men. You got James Monroe and Robert E. Lee. Who's your Who's your uh, female guest? Female guest. Um, or or your musical group or your comedian. Wow, um, comedian. Uh, <laughs> Follow that male guest up with a comedian. <laughs> right, going to be great. Yeah, this is yeah the biggest one eighty ever. Right, comedian. Um, I would, I would love to interview. I would love to interview somebody like a, uh, like a Sidney Poitier. He's not a comedian, but think about he, he, he is one that had to navigate a lot of. You know what I'm saying? Well, he's the first of a lot of things. First right? of a lot of things, right? That's what I was about to say. I think he's a he's the first of a lot of things, and like, and how did he deal with things that were either overt or covert, but still managed to basically bridge gaps? Intelligent, strong, courageous, and graceful. Yeah, are the things that I think about when yeah. I am, yeah. and be a star. He was yeah. a star. Our both a, sides. We're gonna, we're gonna broadly define comedian and, and include Sidney Poitier. <laughs> well, he is funny as hell. So, all right. What, what about music? Music. Um, like as far as a band, like who could I, be a band, could whoever be, you want to be. Um, I would say probably Public Enemy. Okay. Um, because um, you know art imitates life, and so I know like um, 
I know for me coming up, hip hop was a major, major, major influence on me. Um, as as far as gaining what they refer to as uh as part of the five percent of religion. Not that I'm a five percenter, but a lot of early eighties, I mean mid eighties, early nineties hip hop was centered upon the five percent of religion, where it focused on having knowledge of self and understanding history of yourself mm. and introducing you to certain concepts, theories, books and stuff like that. So it's funny because we call it the conscious movement back then. Now they call it being woke. Twenty, thirty years later, they call it being woke. Right. But the conscious movement was about understanding like your African history and understanding like, you know, what makes who you are. Right. But but here's a funny thing that I kind of stumbled across um, lately. I did DNA testing and it comes back. I'm 30 percent European. OK, so that's interesting, right? It does. Make make your last point, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna tease, and then we're gonna we're gonna end it. So I I come back as thirty percent European, right? But 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 back then it was like you know pretty much being conscious, black power, self empowerment, empowerment in general. In fact, I had a professor at Virginia Union who spoke on it all the time, and so that was my first exposure to like like African history, African American history, and knowing who the players were because these things aren't taught. Yeah. So you can't call it CRT if mm-hmm. it's not being taught, but they were actual events. And it's not, you know, so I, I mean, that's a whole other topic. Yeah. But, but, you know, like that's what African-Americans nowadays are screaming for is representation of their experiences, too, because they are part and parcel to the fabric of this nation. Yeah. Cover the breadth and depth like you have other parts of yeah. but, society and culture. But the way you kind of get out of that kind of misinformation is back up your history lessons with primary and secondary sources and you won't lose it. Mm. You know, be able to support what you're claiming. And, All right. When yeah. you come, when you come back, George, um, you're going to name your female guest because you haven't done that yet. Yeah, that's going to be tough. That's all, yeah, it's all good. We're, we're going to give you some time to think about it. Uh, and you mentioned 30% European. You've done a lot of research. You mentioned you went back to the 1780s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've been interviewed by quite a few outlets about your genealogy yeah. and New the York associated Times, history. BBC. We're going to talk about all that. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the thing I asked you before we started recording was, why did all these outlets talk to you? And we're not going to answer that today. We're going yeah. to answer it when we get back together, yeah. uh, whenever we can make that happen. Cool. Appreciate you joining us, man. Yeah, and, uh, yeah it's fun. And, and we are here to help you down your path however we can. <laughs> Absolutely. Good stuff. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com. Thank you.